Welcome all. I am uh, Jeff Snyder. I'm a professor in the Educational Studies Department. I'm uh, Acting Director of, of Africana Studies. I am delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Gerald Moore. Uh, Dr. Moore is the Moore's Professor of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. Uh, Dr. Horn has written over 30 books and 100 scholarly articles and reviews. So, so if I could have the same uh, lifetime output of scholarship that he accomplishes in one calendar year, I would be The scope of his work is truly remarkable, uh, reaching from colonial America to the modern United States, placing African-American experiences in the context of wars, revolutions, and empires across the Americas, Africa, and Asia. The title of his talk today is Apocalypse and Imperialism, Racism, Center of Colonialism, and the Making of the United States. He will be joined in conversation with our very own Dr. Sharice Bernstelli, who's a professor in political science and African <laughs> studies. Uh, he will also field questions from uh, a couple students, senior Africana studies minor Jordan Pagat, if you could wave your hand, and junior Africana studies minor Jorge Banuelos. Uh, I would like to thank Annie Larson, who is sitting up here yes. in the front, for putting this event together. Uh, um, I'd also like to remind you that we have a kind of uh, a blockbuster double feature uh, this afternoon and evening uh, that a half an hour after we conclude here, the annual Leffler Lecture hosted by the History Department is happening exactly in this room. Uh, Martha S. Jones will be delivering a talk called Birthright Citizens, so I encourage you all to stick around for that. Uh, but to get to the matter at hand, please join me in welcoming Dr. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. So in, in Africana Studies, we prefer a conversational uh, type interaction just so that we can share the intellectual comments and um, engage in that way. So I will be fielding a couple of questions to Dr. Horn, and he will respond. Um, and so that will be the format. Uh, so I'm going to start with the first question. Um, so Dr. Horn. In one of your latest books, The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism, you offer an exegesis of the conjuncture of slavery, capitalism, white supremacy, and colonialism in the 17th century. But in actuality, this is a thread you've traced in other works, including The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Negro, Negro Comrades of the Crown, and Confronting the Black Jacobins. Can you explicate this relationship and how it has evolved uh, from the 15th century onward? Yes. <laughs> First of all, thank you for this invitation uh, to Carlton. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, let me also say, as I often say when I speak in the United States, uh, let me also pay homage to the indigenous population of North America, whose territory we're now sitting. Uh, but with regard to your question, the Apocalypse book is the beginning of a story in the early 1600s that, interestingly enough, was just published this year, but it's the beginning of a story that, as the introduction suggested, stretches into 2018. In that book, I talk about how in the early 1600s, uh, England was a minor power on the fringes of Europe, but by the end of the 1600s, uh, England was a major power perhaps even at that point, the premier power on planet Earth, and then it passes the baton on to what I refer to as its revolting spawn, which is now the United States of America, which has now carried that torch of leadership on into the 21st century. Uh, there are many reasons for this development, but the reason I point to is slavery and the slave trade. And this book, the Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism is now being preceded by a book I'm working on now on the 16th century, the 1500s. It's always, I have to say, more interesting to me to speak about stuff I haven't published as opposed to stuff I have published. So feel free, any of you, to ask me about that particular project. 
But in any case, what I tried to do in that book is talk about how the turning point in terms of telescoping this tremendous development of the rise of this power, which helps to explain why we're speaking English in North America, <laughs> uh, comes in 1654, 1655, with the English ousting the Spanish from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Spain, as you know, had a first mover's advantage in terms of 1492, but in a sense met its Waterloo in 1588 when it failed not only in invading England successfully and overthrowing the Protestant power that then ruled in London, but also, interestingly enough, and this is a, a hint to current empires, it was seeking at the same time to invade China simultaneously from the base that it recently established in the Philippines. Uh, there is an argument to be made about imperial overreach and imperial <laughs> overreach that I think current empires might do well to heed. In any case, in 1655, England ousts Spain from Jamaica. At the same time, in, 16, in, in 1654, the Dutch, who had temporarily taken over Brazil from Portugal, was in the process of being pushed out of Brazil. The Protestant powers, and now we're speaking of the Dutch and the English in particular, they were scrappy underdogs, and one way they were able to gain an advantage over the Spanish, who I think it's fair to say were much more sectarian in a religious sense, was welcoming those who were being expelled from Spain and the Iberian Peninsula in, in, in general, speaking of the Jewish population, who in 1492, as you know, uh, were being expelled from Spain. Uh, many of them wind up fleeing to the Dutch, or to the to Holland. They followed the Dutch into Brazil and were very essential to the rise of Dutch rule all during that period, but particularly in Brazil. But with, the Portugal make, with Portugal making a comeback, the Jewish population had reason to fear that the Inquisition, that is to say, forcing conversion to Christianity, uh, might be following in the wake of the Portuguese comeback, and they're looking for a place to land. The other Protestant power, which is London, welcomes them into Jamaica. Uh, they had developed some expertise and capital in terms of the, using slave labor to market and produce sugar. Uh, sugar being a major commodity at that time, not only used to sweeten your tea and coffee, but also seen as a marker of sophistication, and in some quarters even seen as a miracle drug, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with the Jewish population fleeing to Jamaica um, and to the welcoming arms of the English in Jamaica, this helps to contribute to the sugar boom, uh, which pours more wealth into the coffers of London, uh, wealth that then is used to help to build a bigger navy, which can then, or and more ships, which can then be used to transport more migrants to its settlements in North America and in the Caribbean. And also, uh, by the way, transport more enslaved Africans uh, from Africa to be bonded laborers in the Caribbean and in North America. And as well, by 1664, allowing England to oust the Dutch from what is now New York City and a goodly number of the mid-Atlantic states, what are now the mid-Atlantic states in the United States of America. With this accumulated wealth, uh, England senses that, that it's onto something, and that leads to the creation of the Royal African Company in 1672, an attempt to systematize the uh, African slave trade. Um, then by 1683, the other reigning power suffers a setback when the Ottoman Turks stopped at the gates of Vienna. Uh, the Ottoman Turks had been on the march, one could say, at least since 1453, uh, when they uh, took over what is now Istanbul. And of course, you know that leads to a chain of events, according to some historians, that causes the Western Europeans to fear that their road to the wealth 
of Persia, India, and China, this main block, and leads to Columbus's voyage across the Atlantic, looking for India, which is <laughs> why many of us still refer to the indigenous population of the America as Indians. In any case, when the Ottoman Turks suffered the setback, this is also uh, a boom for the Western Europeans, not only because they're blocked moving west, but when the Western Europeans were sailing southward to raid Africa for enslaved labor, they ran the risk of being enslaved themselves uh, by the uh, <laughs> North Africans. There's a story to be told that I'll be telling in my 1500s book about the role of North Africans, who were much more of a major player than I think some of us have imagined. And as I was telling Mr. Williams' class this morning, uh, you can see this reflected in Shakespeare's Othello with this positive portrayal uh, of North Africa. That's because, in many ways, what happened, to, just to telescope the argument, is that London was in alliance <laughs> with the North Africans against the capital power. Because that was their mutual antagonist, that is to say, the Iberians, mm -hmm. the Spanish and the Portuguese, which leads to this positive portrayal of North Africans and Moors that you see in Othello. But, it, but in any case, with 1683, uh, the Western Europeans have less of a fear that when they're selling southward, they'll wind up in the slave markets of Turkey, <laughs> which then leads them to expand uh, exponentially uh, the slave trade, which gets a further shot of adrenaline in 1688 with the so-called Glorious Revolution, uh, which current historiography is looking at uh, with, uh, shall we say, a more negative lens than previous historians. That is to say, a lot of the current scholarship is suggesting that one of the motive forces for the so-called Glorious Revolution was that under the guise of expanding parliamentary power, particularly parliamentary power as reflected in the interest class interests of the merchants, the merchants really wanted to elbow their way in into this lucrative African slave trade, which had been under the thumb of the monarch, whereby you could invest one dollar and get a seventeen dollar profit. And I dare say that even today there are those <laughs> who sell their firstborn in order to get a seventeen hundred percent profit. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this, of course, the Glorious Revolution, among other things, leads to uh, an explosion of the African slave trade. Uh, in my book, I call it Apocalypse Now, in terms of Africans in particular. Um, one of the reasons there are millions of Africans in North America today, you can trace back to 1688. Um, as I said in the book, uh, these merchants, they descend upon Africa with the maniacal energy of crazed bees, manacling and handcuffing every African in sight, dragging them across the Atlantic to work in the sugar fields, uh, for example, creating tremendous wealth. But of course, uh, many of these Africans are not interested in working for free, <laughs> for whatever reason. And this also leads to uh, a spate of slave revolts, which are unfolding even before 1688. And that's why uh, South Carolina is in many ways a colony of a colony, as the saying goes, because settlers, European settlers from Barbados uh, helped to found South Carolina. Uh, they make what I call the great trek from the Caribbean to the North American mainland. Uh, but that does not necessarily rescue them from the enraged fury enslaved Africans. For example, some of you may know about Stonewall's Rebellion in South Carolina in 1739, uh, spearheaded by Angolans, by the way. Uh, and current scholarship also is disaggregating the concept of Africa, that is to say, drilling down to ascertain what part of Africa these bonded laborers are emerging from. And those of you who follow the news may know that uh, Angola in Southwest Africa uh, has endured uh, centuries of conflict, uh, including in the 20th century, all the United States of America, as you may recall. And many of the Africans were transported across the Atlantic uh, or defeated in wars. That's why they wind up uh, being sold into slavery. And they're bringing 
martial skills with them. They're bringing military skills with them. Some of you may be familiar, for example, uh, with capoeira, uh, which is better known as uh, African martial arts associated with Brazil. Uh, but it would be a mistake to see those Angolan Brazilians as the sole repository of capoeira and martial arts techniques. And uh, this military and martial skill then is a explodes in South Carolina in 1739. Their Africans rise up, try to overthrow the English settlements. They're being assisted by the Spanish. And one of the, the themes of my work, to get to your question, is this historic tendency of the African population in North America to align with the real or imagined enemies of those who are ruling the Euro-American elites. And this manifests itself most directly with regard to Stonewall's Rebellion, but you can trace this with regard to the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804. You can trace it with regard to alliances with Mexico during the time of Texas independence, 1836. Uh, you can trace it with regard to British abolitionism. For example, um, one of the books you could have mentioned was my book, Negro Comrades of the Crown, African Americans in the British Empire fight the United States before emancipation. Sorry? That's the second one I mentioned. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, after 1739, of course, uh, this is where the traditional narrative of U.S. history kicks in. Uh, London moves to expel the Spanish from Florida, who had been assisting the Africans in Angola, excuse me, the Africans in South Carolina, and expel the French from Canada. Of course, the French in Canada and Quebec had been assisting the Africans in New York in a major slave rebellion in 1741. Mm -hmm. This leads to the so-called Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763. And London succeeds. The Spanish are ousted temporarily from Florida. The French are ousted altogether from Quebec, Canada. And as you know, a lingering national question uh, still persists uh, in Canada with a French-derived population that as of now seems to have moved away from the idea of seceding from Canada. But stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> I don't see this issue dying anytime soon. But in any case, after succeeding in that conflict, um, London tries to impose taxes on the settlers to pay for what they had done for the settlers, and ousting the Spanish from Florida and the French from Quebec. As you know, many settlers, even to this very day, don't like to pay taxes <laughs> for what they're receiving. Perhaps that has something to do with being so dependent upon free labor. Perhaps I think that things should be free. But in any case, uh, at the same time, London, in the Royal Proclamation of 1762, seeks to restrain the settlers from moving west across the Appalachian territory, for example, to continue seizing the land of the indigenous population. Uh, this is enraging to many real estate speculators who, as you know, uh, still play a major role in the politics of North America. Right. And <laughs> including real estate speculator number one, George Washington. And then by 1772, uh, London and Somerset's case uh, moves to abolish slavery in England itself because, of course, uh, they had glimpsed that relying upon this slave labor force uh, in introduces a certain kind of instability because of the Africans' continual proclivity to try to align with the real or imagined enemies of London. By the way, uh, Somerset's case is reflected in the movie Bell. Anybody see Bell with Hugo and Martha Roy? You should see it. It's very interesting. It's an interesting movie. And these sorts of events enrage the settlers, so they go behind the on his back and ally with the antagonists of London, the French and the Spanish, and revolt in 1776 would not have been successful without the assistance of the French in particular, uh, particularly at the pivotal Battle of Yorktown, which leads to the uh, final surrender uh, of the British. And the problem there, of course, from the French point of view, is that uh, they overstretch in order to assist the Yankees, the triumphant Yankees, uh, would introduce strains into their own colonial empire, uh, leading to, in other words, there's an expansion of the slave trade uh, into Hispaniola, 
particular. And there's a short leap from their assistance to the settlers of North America, leading to the formation of the United States of America by 1783, to the Haitian Revolution commencing in 1791. The Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, uh, leads to a general crisis of the entire slave system. That is to say that London realizes that the jig is up because like revolutionaries anywhere, the Haitians want to spread their gospel near and wide, not least to neighboring Jamaica. And of course, as evidence suggests, that the man who lights the fuse in August 1791 is in fact Jamaican. Um, London then moves by 1807 to abolish its role in the slave trade. As I think I told Mr. Williams' class this morning, uh, in 2007, uh, there was a major ceremony in London featuring Queen Elizabeth and Prime Minister Tony Blair marking the end of the Britain's role in the African slave trade. The United States moves in 1808 to do the same, not least because of pressure from London, and also the example of Haiti, because by bringing more Africans across the Atlantic, in many ways you're just bringing more grave diggers for the system. But in any case, London knew that the jig was up the United States dug in his heels. But with regard to these ceremonies 200 years later, you may want to ask yourself why there was no major ceremony in this country <laughs> in 2008 marking the end of the U.S. role in the African slave trade. Uh, I'm reluctant to hazard a guess because of what the dire and dangerous implications might be, but I'll leave those to your <laughs> fertile imagination. In any case, uh, London then moves in 1833, 1834 to abolish slavery itself. Uh, interestingly enough, compensating the slave owners, and as you know, the Haitians had to compensate the slave owners too, which helped to deform the economy going forward. And in fact, with many of the former slave owners then moving to New Orleans, Savannah, Charleston, in many ways Haiti was sending money to New Orleans, Charleston, Savannah, etc which is one of the reasons why before 1860, the U.S. Civil War, you have uh, New Orleans probably having more millionaires per capita than any other U.S. city. Uh, I already made reference to what was going on in Texas, so perhaps I was in your class. I'm sort of getting these confused. But in any case, uh, Mexico uh, had rebelled against Spain uh, by 18, the 1820s. Uh, Mexico had a president of African descent, Vicente Guerrero, 180 years before the election of Barack Hussein Obama in the United States of America. Mexico had also moved to abolish uh, slavery itself, but at the same time, they made a contrasting maneuver that ultimately was debilitating to Mexico. What I mean is that they were inviting Anglo settlers <laughs> to come into what was then northern Mexico. Tejas, or Texas in particular. And uh, once Mexico abolished slavery, uh, many of these slave owners led by Stephen F. Austin, for which the capital city of today's Texas is now named, uh, were <coughs> reluctant uh, to follow that edict of abolishing slavery, leading to Texas independence by 1836. Texas then becomes a major slave trading nation. It's the Lone Star flag could be found off the coast of Brazil, off the coast of Angola, uh, for example. As I say, my book on Cuba, Race to Revolution, the United States and Cuba during slavery and Jim Crow. One of the reasons you have so many uh, black people in Cuba is because of Texas slave owners, Texas slave traders, excuse me. Uh, Galveston, the home not only of Jack Johnson, the heavyweight boxing champion, but also Barry White. <laughs> 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 Galveston was a major slave port, particularly if you look at your map as a straight shot to the ports of uh, Cuba. Uh, but then, uh, Texas, independent Texas could not withstand the pressure from revolutionary Haiti and British abolitionists, and then it crawls into the United States of America by 1845. Although, as you may know, there is an independence movement in Texas, as we speak, that would like to see Texas become an independent nation once again. I dare say if that happens, I might be seeking uh, 
exile and refuge and asylum in Minnesota. <laughs> Please don't turn me away when I arrive. But in any case, uh, the, uh, as I make the argument, there are many reasons for the U.S. Civil War. But one reason that needs to be emphasized more, it seems to me, is this external pressure. Just like when we talk about the retreat from Jim Crow in the 20th century, in the 1950s, external pressure is a major reason. That is to say, the Cold War and the United States trying to point the finger of accusation in Moscow for <coughs> rights violations in a time when African nations and Caribbean nations are coming to independence and looking askance at the United States' own human rights records. That creates external pressure for the United States to move away from Jim Crow. And many of our historians, many of our historians have incorporated that argument into the conversation, uh, but not incorporate an argument into your general conversation, it seems to me it leads you to try to look at a race between sailing boats and attributing the success of one sailboat over another sailboat to the ingenuity of the person at the wheel as opposed to the winds that are propelling that particular sailboat. And similarly, with regard to the U.S. Civil War, I think this external pressure from British abolitionists and Haitian revolutionaries uh, plays a major role in that. I, I won't go into the U.S. Civil War, but I will uh, say this in my book, The White Pacific, U.S. Imperialism and Black Slavery After the Civil War. It talks about the story, it tells the story of these U.S. slave traders, another reference. <laughs> who like took the Keith Sweat line, make it last forever with regard, <laughs> with regard to slavery and the slave trade. And so they moved to the South Sea to begin enslaving the Melanesians and the Polynesians, uh, taking them to Fiji and Queens and Australia. But what happens is, is a couple of things. One, the Australians, they look at the United States and they say the United States is a negative example in terms of having a multiracial population because as they see it, that led to civil war, tens of hundreds of thousands of people being killed. So after a while, they begin, they move to the white Australian policy, which, which, which also is consistent with the idea of the Australian Federation coming together. Some, some, simultaneously, uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom an independent nation, which in many ways is, is as sophisticated in terms of infrastructure uh, as the United States was at a particular time in history. Uh, they tried to work out a pact with a rise in Japan. Uh, I won't advert to the story of the black ships from the United States sailing to Japan in 1853 in the aftermath of the British taking over Hong Kong 1841 to 1842. There was a fear in Japan that they were next on the colonial chopping block. Uh, they go through this amazing transformation, culminating in a kind of ouster of many feudal elements, which, by the way, is reflected in the movie The Last Samurai. Anybody see that? It's a very interesting movie. Although, interestingly enough, you know, it's made by capitalist Hollywood, but they make heroes of the feudal elements, if you'll notice, much more so than the capitalist elements. It's very, very interesting, almost bizarre. But in any case, um, so to this very day, a plurality of the population in Hawaii is of Japanese ancestry because of this deal that an independent Hawaii was trying to work out in Tokyo. But alas, uh, that does not work. And by the 1890s, uh, the United States overthrows the Hawaii Kingdom. It becomes a US neo colony and is incorporated into the United States in 1959 as the 50th and presumably final state in the United States of America. And uh, if, assuming that you reject the pre-September no, pre 2016 remarks of your 45th president, the 44th president was born there in August 1961. But of course, pre-September 2016, your 45th president was saying that that's not true. I'll leave that for the historians to sort out. But just, just to stop, because I know you have more questions than I've been speaking for a long time. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just stop there and let you. I hope I responded in some way to your. Uh, <laughs> what, 
about how generous you are to say, as you may know, as you know, we don't know this. <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate the assumption. So I want to ask a question that brings us more up to um, our current historical mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. um, so one might argue mm -hmm. that we are in a period of fundamental crisis, mm -hmm. uh, constituted not least by right-wing populist advance, uh, white nationalist revanchism, extreme environmental de uh, degradation, and the increased polarization and hoarding of wealth and resources. Likewise, those like former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, Yale professors Timothy Snyder and Jason Stanley, and certified member of the 1%, Michael Kinsley, are all discussing the possibility of fascism uh, descending on the United States. Can you talk a little bit about what exactly fascism is? And relatedly, um. How and why did Trump get elected? And what might it have to do with a previous epoch, that is to say the Cold War? And how could a nation that has discussed um, its purported democratic traditions swing so easily to the cusp of alleged fascism? Wow. Well, let me try to take this bit by bit. And what I omit from responding to is you can remind me. My own argument is, and this, this can, by, by the way, be found in, on YouTube. I, I gave a lecture at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill in February 2018 where I made this point that there are many reasons and explanations for the 45th president being elected in November 2016. But what I put forward in that lecture was that you have to look at the previous epic, uh, the Cold War. That is to say, among other things, the Cold War involved a crackdown on progressive labor and class-based organizations. And in terms of the breadth of my work, one of the points I've been trying to make is that if you look in preceding centuries, you had a move from religion as the axis of society. Uh, think of the religious wars between the Protestant powers, which I just made reference to, and London, the Netherlands versus the Catholic powers, for example. And then I make the argument that uh, one of the, quote, successes, unquote, uh, of the United States, when it was founded, was that it moved away from religion as an axis of society. Not, not altogether successfully, I'm sure you're familiar with the anti-Catholic uh, attacks on convents in the 19th century, uh, anti-Semitism, for example. Mm -hmm. But it moved more decisively towards race, quote unquote, uh, as an axis of society. Uh, this is reflected in a sense in the First Amendment, which called for freedom of religion, for example, at least on paper. And this construction of whiteness, which has a gradual evolution, I'm, I'm still trying to track, hmm. track it down in terms of its antecedents, but it certainly broadens the base for settler colonialism. Um, one of the problems, among others, with Spain was the sectarianism. Uh, it's narrowing the base for settler colonialism, for example, with the Inquisition, uh, chasing out the Jewish population, which then sends them into the arms of the Netherlands, for example, sends them into the arms of the Ottoman Turks, for example. Whereas whiteness broadens the base because those who were warring on the shores of Europe, English versus Irish, English versus Scots in the first place, but then include uh, broadening to British versus German, German versus Russian, uh, Russian versus Pole, Serb versus Croat, uh, French versus Italian. Once they cross the Atlantic, they're magically transmuted into this new identity politics, to use the term that's somehow never applied to what I'm describing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, this construction of whiteness, which, which broadens the base uh, for settler colonialism. And, and in some ways, it also helps to obscure class hierarchy uh, as well. In my 1776 book, I talk about the story of Georgia, the U.S. state, uh, which was founded in the 1730s as a so-called all-white project. Uh, no Negroes allowed. Now, in light of the 2010 census, which showed that Georgia had more black people than any other state, obviously that project didn't work out. <laughs> but 
And of course, just as a side, side line, they were trying to do that, of course, because you know, the Africans were always conspiring with the Spanish in neighboring Florida, et cetera, and so they were trying to keep them out altogether. But it didn't work out because it was reintroducing class tensions amongst the European settlers. It was reinscribing in North America what supposedly people were trying to avoid by coming across the Atlantic. So th th there is this, this transition or this movement from religion to race. And then in the 20th century, you have the rise of class-based projects, particularly with the rise of trade unions, the rise of socialist movements, etc. With the Cold War, there was an all-out attack upon many of these class-based movements, particularly unions. The example I used from my uh, Hawaii book, um, Derek, what's that? Hey. Oh, very good. <laughs> good. Fighting in paradise, sorry. Uh, like labor unions, racism, and something in the creation of modern Hawaii. But, what I talk about in that book is that there's an all-out attack. Exhibit A in this regard is the attack on the West Coast Longshoremen under Harry Bridges. Well born in Melbourne, Australia, migrates to San Francisco, leads the San Francisco General Strike of 1934, then begins to organize all amongst the West Coast, including in the Pacific. Uh, there's an attempt to deport him. Uh, he spends a small fortune on lawyers trying to avoid being deported, but they're trying to deport him because he's a militant labor union labor unionists uh, seeking to improve working conditions and wages uh, for his members. And that was seen as inimical uh, to the uh, Cold War trajectory. And so one of the points that I would argue in terms of the election of the 45th president is that this attack upon uh, progressive labor uh, has a, a very weakening impact, I would say, on the consciousness, on the class consciousness. Particularly, I would say, of the Euro-American working class, but also, I would say, on the working class in general. But with regard to the so-called non-white working class, at the same time that this is happening, you're having the weakening of Jim Crow. And so in some ways, you have uh, trying to ride two horses going in different directions mm -hmm. at the same time. Uh, a weakening of class-based organizations as anti-racism is, is accelerating. Now, on the one hand, for the black population particularly, it leads to this idea that now Jim Crow barriers fall, so you can now check into a hotel, but because of the unions being weakened, you don't have the money to pay the bill. <laughs> but at the same time, it leads to this idea that the US ruling elite cares more about black people because they're weakening Jim Crow than they care about other people. Which, believe it or not, there are some people who actually believe that. And then this leads to a kind of grassroots revolt against uh, anti-Jim Crow measures. Look at Little Rock, 1957, the attempt to desegregate the high school there, which leads to President Eisenhower sending federal troops into Central High School to prevent black students from being mauled <laughs> by their fellow students. Uh, Ole Miss, University of Mississippi, federal troops have to be dispatched once again in the early 1960s to allow James Meredith, one lone black student, to desegregate. There are killings there as, as a result. To show it's not a, a sexual issue, the Boston busing crisis of the 1970s, um, whereby they attempt to send black students uh, into these previously uh, all white schools, leads to riots and all sorts of unrest. There's a famous Pulitzer Prize winning photograph that some of you might, you might, since you have internet connections, you probably could call it up, of this black man in a three-piece suit in the course of the uh, Boston fracas being spearheaded in the head with a guy carrying, a white guy carrying a, a US flag. Mm -hmm. uh, prize winning photograph. And, and, to, to, and then further in the 1980s, uh, with the housing desegregation crisis in Yonkers, which was the subject of another interesting movie, Show Me a Hero. You should add that to your list. Did anybody see Show Me a Hero? Very interesting. Didn't you think so? Yeah. Very interesting. About the desegregation crisis in Yonkers. And so all, there are already signs <laughs> in the United States of this sort of what you call revanchism, right-wing populist revolt that's reflected 
in uh, these protests against desegregation, uh, for example, which then, of course, carries the seeds, uh, hopefully it'll just remain the seeds of, of fascism, uh, that is to say, a, a mass movement involving naked and open terrorism by the most retrograde and backward elements, uh, not least in the elite of this country, uh, that would, among other things, shut down discussions like this altogether. Not to mention leading to enhanced and accelerated persecution against people like myself and people like many of yourselves, etc. Uh, I think that we there is a possibility that we can stave off that movement, although the jury is still out. And let me say in this context that I find it heartening, because I know I'm saying a lot of things that don't sound very uh, pleasant or optimistic, <laughs> that at least in elite circles, which one has to pay very careful attention to, uh, there's much more questioning of the US system of late, and, and particularly, I would say, in light of these Kavanaugh hearings. I've seen more questioning about maybe expanding the US Supreme Court, which generally is seen as a no-no in the United States. I've seen more critiques of the Electoral College, uh, people pointing out how often the victor, as happened in 2016, get fewer votes than the, per than the person who actually got the most votes and then is propelled into office, nonetheless. I see more critiques of the very structure of the US Senate, uh, the fact that North Dakota, your neighbor, uh, which is a dwarf compared, excuse me, is a mineral <laughs> compared <laughs> to the whale that is Minnesota, but yet receives a similar representation in the US Senate, which means that a vote cast in North Dakota is worth more than a vote cast in Minnesota, that sort of critique goes to the essence of a critique of the U.S. system as it exists. I <clears throat> notice that of late. I see it more bubbling up to the surface. That's a good sign. But the United States, I would say, is still suffering from the Cold War, the weakening of labor, particularly the weakening of labor, not only organizationally, but ideologically. Um, and I would say also the weakening ideologically of the black community. For example, excuse me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I, I, I won't footnote you when I use that. <laughs> Vice President Mike Pence gave a very important speech at the Hudson Institute just a few days ago, basically announcing a new Cold War against China, which is going to transform this country, transform the world, if it proceeds like the previous Cold War um, with regard to Moscow. What's interesting, as I was thinking, is that in March 1946, when Winston Churchill, the defeated British politician, came to Fulton, Missouri, mm -hmm. alongside U.S. President Harry Truman to give his speech announcing the uh, onset of this new Cold War, there was mass protests in the black community by people like Paul Robeson, W.B. Du Bois, Shirley Graham Du Bois, etc. And of course, we all know <laughs> they, they paid a very heavy price as a result. But at least in the bargain, there were some anti-Jim Crow concessions that leads to Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, and the formal retreat of Jim Crow, that's to say U.S. apartheid. With Mike Pence's speech, I haven't noticed, and I, I try to follow these things, I haven't noticed any sort of outcry. It's almost like it didn't happen. And that, that's part of the problem, uh, that you could have this major pronouncement auguring a major shift in foreign policy, in our tax dollars, and national, national uh, our, our, our budget. And it's like it didn't happen. And I have to say that uh, I find that um, concerning. All right, thank you. So we're going to call this the lightning round. Oh, okay. You're going to oh, concisely, oh, concisely answer uh, questions from our two wonderful minors, uh, Jordan and Jorge. So why don't we start with Jordan? Come up and have a seat and ask your question. And Horn will concisely answer. <laughs> thank you for being here. 
Um, my question is, in the apocalypse of settler col colonialism, you state that there has been a migration from societies with racism mm -hmm. to racist societies. Mm -hmm. At what point in history did this migration manifest, and what are some of the different forms of these racist societies? Well, what I was trying to indicate there, it actually, and I will be concise, it, it, it alludes to what I was saying about the Jewish population, how many of them were fleeing uh, inquisitorial Spain, inquisitorial Portugal, post-1492, actually in Portugal even before 1492, actually in Spain in a sense. <laughs> and these are uh, bigoted societies, anti-Semitic societies, and they're, they're migrating to the Caribbean, for example, to the, where the Union Jack is unfurled. And certainly there's anti-Semitism in, uh, under British rule, or under English rule, I should say. But it, it's a far cry from Spain and Portugal. And likewise, what's interesting is that that is taking place as you have this transition from societies with slavery which I think is a way you could characterize many of the North American settlements uh, pre-1688 or pre-1672 to slave societies, mm -hmm. which you basically have by the end of the 1600s and the beginnings of the 1700s. And so that, that, that's one of the ironies that I see uh, taking place with regard to the uh, aphorism about moving from uh, societies with slavery to slave society. Societies with racism, racism to racist societies. To racist societies. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we laugh, you, you could see apartheid South Africa as being a racist society, mm -hmm. and post, well, I was about to say, you could see post 1954 the United States as a society with racism. No, no, I won't go there. A racial, let's, let's say racialist. Okay, because it's it's mitigated in particular ways. Mm -hmm. You got some chips in the cookie now. Mm -hmm. Jim ain't even think, but. That was concise. Yes, that was great. Thank you so much, Jordan. Thank you. Okay. All right, let's have a question now. That's the question. Dr. Horn, first, first and foremost, thank you very much. Uh, my question is, throughout the colonial encounter, European Christian institutions were always at the forefront of similar colonialism and slavery. Since many of these churches, such as the Anglican and Catholic Church, still exist, in what way should we view their evangelical projects abroad as products of a colonial order of things? Well, <laughs> a, a few points. Uh, in, in Hawaii, there was a saying that uh, the missionaries came with religion and the indigenous people had the land, but, one, but over a certain period of time, <laughs> The, religious, the indigenous people had the Bible, the missionaries and their descendants had the land. And certainly you, you can see uh, missionaries as sort of the advanced wave of uh, colonialism, settler colonialism. By the way, I mean, I don't recommend this film, but it illustrates this point. <laughs> Silence, Martin Scorsese's film, Silence, anybody see that? It, it's a film about Japan and how in the, in the 1640s, as the Europeans are spreading their tentacles all over the world, Japan goes into self-imposed exile until 1853, when the black ships from the United States come. And the film is about uh, how <laughs> the Japanese leaders are massacring any missionary who arrives on Japanese soil. And I think it was an illustration of what you were just saying. Now, today, of course, in terms of the evangelicals, so pay very close attention to this election in Brazil. Mm -hmm. It's taking place where Mr. Bolsonaro, who makes Trump seem like a left winger, <laughs> is poised to become Brazil's next president. Uh, he is, you know, there is an alliance, as the saying goes, between the Bible, the beef, Bible, beef, and bullets. That is to say, bullets being the military. Beef being the agricultural interests, and then the Bible being the evangelical community. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have the mass influence, and uh, they are beating the drum for this fascist to come to power, uh, who makes uh, very insulting comments about women, very insulting comments about black people. He said if he had a gay son, he would wish he were dead. 
Um, it's a very worrisome development. And as you know, one of the, what's characterized Latin America in particular in recent decades is the rise of, is the decline of the Catholic Church, particularly after some priests have ventured into liberation theology, particularly in the Sandinista Nicaragua, post-1979, and how that opened the door for these evangelical Christians. And of course, you don't have to go to Latin America to, to question the role of evangelical Christians, because of course they've been a major factor in the United States of America, not least right here in uh, Minnesota. So that's my response. Thank you very much. <laughs> about 10 minutes left, so we can take maybe one or two questions from the audience. Uh, please keep them brief and direct, no soliloquy, so that we can share the intellectual space and let Dr. Horn answer. All right, so any questions from the audience? Please, Anita. Uh, think a lot about where do you see the role of uh, movements such as the Fight for 15 kinds of movements in terms of like as actually organizing labor? Do you see that as a potential move forward to kind of fight the kinds of things we were talking about? Well, absolutely. Uh, and the Fight for 15 had an unacknowledged victory just recently mm -hmm. when uh, Amazon uh, decided to raise the minimum wage of its workers. Jeff Bezos, as you know, controlling shareholder of Amazon, carrying the reputation as the richest man in the United States, if not on planet Earth as a whole. And I don't think you can separate that victory from the victory from labor, particularly the Service Employees International Union, which has been playing a vanguard role in terms of the fight for, oh, the fight for $15 an hour minimum wage, for example, which is now leading some to clamor for a $19 minimum hour minimum wage. In fact, the airport workers in the New York City metropolitan area just got a boost in wages to $19 an hour, which I think will help to raise wages, well, if we play it right, it will help to raise wages generally. And I think it's not just the raise in wages, it's, it's also the kind of class consciousness that I think is attendant to that, that sort of struggle where working people tend to see themselves as a class in and of itself, uh, where they stress their class identity and, as opposed to the identity of those who are exploiting them and extracting their labor uh, for pittance. So I'm, I'm very heartened, and I'm glad you raised that, because as I look back on my remarks, uh, a lot of what I've been saying is sort of a downer. And um, so I'm happy to talk about something more positive. <laughs> Other questions? Please, by every Do you believe a post-racial society is possible? <laughs> I see you don't. <laughs> you couldn't finish the question without giggling. <laughs> well, let me ask you, do you think a post-racial society is possible? I don't know, I can't. I really can't answer the question, but probably not. <laughs> well, I don't know. I guess it depends on what you mean by that. I mean, I, I think that on the positive side, I mean, you know, let, let me say the obvious. So on the positive side, I think there's been steps forward. But I, I think that we've lost sight of why those steps forward, those movements forward took place. As I tried to indicate during my remarks, I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that the oppressed communities were trying to internationalize their struggle. Uh, they did not see their struggle as limited to the four corners in the United States of America. They were making alliances with the Spanish in Florida, the British abolitionists, the Haitian revolutionaries, the socialist camp, and decolonization movements of the 20th century, etc. I, I, I spoke uh, to this countless group at the University of Houston the other day, Students with Justice in Palestine. And one of the points that I was trying to make to them was that uh, in addition to what they were already doing, they need to internationalize the struggle. I suggested that they, they meet with uh, the Council of Representatives in Houston. And I, I pointed in particular to Turkey, uh, since Turkey has major conflicts and contradictions with the United States of America right now. And then lo and behold, I read in the paper yesterday that 
Turkey has renamed the street where the new U.S. Embassy in Ankara is about to be built after Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And that President Erdogan, when he came to the United Nations just uh, weeks ago, met with the daughters of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, I think that there are all these potentialities for struggle that are not being exploited for whatever reason. Uh, people are not keeping up. Maybe people are comfortable. People, maybe people feel that this is as far as we're going to go and that things can't get any better, which is a depressing thought if you think about it. But for whatever reason, I think that these potentialities for struggle are not being exploited. So, uh, so would that be like an attack on capitalism in just the United States in general? Well, I think at some point that is going to have to come to the agenda. <laughs> but I don't think that as of now uh, that should be a dividing line. Um, because as I was just saying, I mean, you, you have. You know, folks on the editorial page of the New York Times are making searching critiques of the present political system of the United States of America. I'm sure they would consider themselves to be pro-capitalist. And so I think that we should uh, unite with them on the basis of transforming radically the political system. And down the road, we'll have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. <laughs> yeah. A new popular front? Perhaps. <laughs> OK. Uh, Professor Brewer? Yeah, um, you said something a couple of weeks ago about this internationalist piece uh, that I think is worth repeating about going back to the Cold War mm -hmm. and the troubles. This is the 150th birth year of Du Bois and mm -hmm. others who were involved. And I don't know if students know that history or not, but I think it's worth, uh, worth repeating that a lot of this is intentional, that that is the closure of our struggle around internationalism. So can mm -hmm. you speak a little bit to that? Well, I mean, as I said, I have to go back to what I said a moment or two ago about what happened in March 1946. Winston Churchill came to Missouri, accompanied by uh, President Truman, to announce the onset of the Cold War. W.B. Du Bois, Paul Robeson, all of this, this phalanx of internationalists uh, protest, uh, protest vigorously. In my book on Paul Robeson, I, I talk about a meeting that he has with Harry Truman in the White House, where he's protesting against the Cold War, he's protesting against uh, lynching of, of black Americans, and his denunciation of Truman is so vigorous that supposedly Truman's face is turning purple <laughs> as the blood vessel is expanding, to his, uh, the blood is expanding to his brain or whatever. So, and of course we know the story that uh, there is then a systematic effort to his uh, passport is revoked, he suffers assassination attempts, Du Bois is put on trial in 1950, 1951, barely escapes going to prison at the age of 83. Uh, many of their colleagues and comrades uh, are not as lucky and they're chased into exile, such as Claudia Jones, <laughs> for example, in yeah, Trinidad, yeah. chased back to London. Uh, Ferdinand Smith, who I wrote a book about, the leading black trade unionists and the seafarers union. He was chased back to his native Jamaica. And then with the ground prepared, the analogy I use is what the United States said it was doing in uh, Central America uh, to pacify Central America in the 1950s. Uh, fusiles y frijoles. Bean, no, rifles and beans. That is to say, rifles, you know, the hard fist of repression, and then concessions. Uh, and that, that's a very potent combination because people like those beans, they like those concessions. And that helps to convince them that perhaps that they should take the beans rather than face the rifles. And, and in a sense, that, that a similar sort of strategy was, was what afflicted black America uh, during, during the 1950s exactly. and going forward. We all know what happened to the Black Panther Party, for example, that was part of the rifle strategy. <laughs> and then many of us got uh, these anti-Jim Crow concessions, uh, which were sufficient to quell dissent to a certain degree. Black eyed peas, we took them. Okay. <laughs> well, all right. We have reached the end of our time. Thank you all for coming.